has already reminded you this morning, we are one year into <laughs> the study of the book of Revelation. I had to run to my office because I forgot two pages of my notes, and uh, we would have been a few minutes short if I had done that. But I said to him, no, Will, on the way down, I said, now remember, I did not preach the book of Revelation in November or December. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Zach has preached a few times in between. But we are coming again this morning to our study of the book of Revelation, and we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13. So let's take our Bibles, let's turn there, and uh, let's consider what God has for us from this passage this morning. Now, as you're turning there, remember we are in the fourth section of this book. The book is divided into seven sections. And we are in the fourth section, and this fourth section really has to do with uh, persecution of believers. It has to do with the suffering of the saints, the war that is on the saints in between the first and the second coming of Christ, and indeed intensifying uh, with incredible intensity prior to the return of Christ. And if you remember, last time we ended up in this 12th chapter, which is the first of this fourth section of the book. The fourth section is chapters 12, 13, and 14, which talk about this persecution. We end at chapter 12, where we saw in some great imagery and graphic form a picture of a woman who is about to have a child and a dragon, a red dragon, who is after this male child that this woman is going to have. And all of that imagery in chapter 12 gave us a behind-the-scenes look at the war and the conflict that was going on with the purpose of God to bring the Savior into the world. The woman was Israel, who God was using to bring Jesus into the world. And Mary ultimately is the woman who birthed in a virgin birth, the Savior. And at that moment, you know the story at Christmas, you know it so very well, that at that moment, that's when Herod, an instrument and a tool of this satanic plan, sought that opportunity once again to stop the eternal purpose of God and the plan to bring a savior. However, as chapter 12 taught us that God absolutely triumphed over Satan and the victory was won. We likened it unto at the cross when Jesus bore our sins, when he took away death that we were always living in fear of, that is the judgment that would come. When he experienced that on the cross, he bore, as it were, the lightning of God's wrath and judgment in our place. And in so doing, he actually beat Satan and won the victory. And that is what chapter 12 is about. Now, it's important as we ended that chapter, and it brings us to chapter 13, to know that just because Jesus beat Satan at the cross and he won the battle in a decisive way and the lightning of God's judgments was being born uh, upon Christ and striking the devil, as it were, in judgment down to the earth, it does not mean that Satan has given up doesn't mean that at all remember we talked about we live in this tension between what is now and what will be one day what happened now in the in this uh, inaugurated of the uh, inauguration of the gospel and this start of the kingdom and the purpose of god christ came to establish his kingdom to to call men and women boys and girls jew and gentile bond and free all kinds of people into his kingdom into that spiritual kingdom and when he called them he made provision through the cross to give them the victory and the triumph over all the sin and all the judgment that their sin deserved, and he did beat Satan there, and it's like lightning that struck him in judgment. But there's also something that is coming later we're looking forward to, and I likened it to you last week to the sound of thunder. Because when you see lightning, you know in a minute you're going to hear something called thunder. And what we're waiting on is that visible manifestation of the reign and the rule of Christ when all that he paid for, all that he won for us at Calvary is visible and clearly obvious to all. And we hear the clap of the thunder of God's judgment in a visible way before the world and everyone uh, who has ever existed. Now, what we're going to do this morning, though, is come to chapter 13, which is going to bring us to some more understanding about this war. And this war that we're going to look at in chapter 13 introduces a couple more characters to this imagery in this story. We've seen a dragon, but now we're about to be introduced in chapter 13 to a couple beasts. And I want you to notice as we read the first 10 verses where we see the first beast at. 
And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Remember, we know who he is from Revelation 12. That is Satan. That is the devil. Then I saw, it says, a beast. Here's another character coming to the story about persecution of believers in between the first and second coming of Christ. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, or crowns, and on his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority." I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So here's what I want you to notice. So far, we've been introduced in chapter 12 to a dragon. And now who is the picture of and represents in the story of redemption the devil. And here in this picture on the screen, you see that he is standing like verse 1 says on the shore in chapter 13. And out of the shore, out of the sea comes a beast. So we have a dragon and now a beast that enters the picture. Now I want you to notice something that in this chapter as we will come to it next week, there is also another beast that we'll find in this chapter. And if you look down in verse 11, you'll see that beast He says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. So we've got two beasts over the next couple of weeks that we need to learn about and understand who they are and how this uh, fits into this time of persecution and suffering for the saints of God in between the first and the second coming of Christ. Now, what I want you to think about these two beasts, and we're only going to think of one this morning, and we're going to see what he does, but both of the beasts are instruments in the hands of the dragon. They assist the dragon. In other words, we've seen the behind-the-scenes uh, war that has gone on when, when Satan was trying to destroy and kill the coming of Christ and the Savior into the world. Now that fury comes down to the earth, and he turns on those on the earth. And what we're going to learn here is that both of these beasts serve as instruments or tools or assistance to help carry out this wrath and this fury of his. Now, another thing I want you to note as we work through this chapter here is that both of the beasts in uh, this chapter have a specific method that they use to assist Satan in the torment and in the persecution that they help him with. The first beast that we're going to look at this morning in verses 1 through 10 is the beast from the sea. I'm going to go ahead and tell you how I'm going to see it, and you know, if you want to see it differently, you can be wrong. That's okay, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's a lot of room in this chapter for disagreement, okay? (laughs) But you know me. I got a position. I got to tell you what it is. So anyway, the beast from the sea. We're going to look at the beast of the sea and from the sea like the political, government, and military forces that are turned against the believer. And we're going to look at that from the standpoint that the instrument that this beast uses to assist Satan in this war on the saints, listen very carefully, is fear fear. That is one of his weapons of torment and attack that you will see over and over again. If you study anything about the spiritual wars and the battles that go on in the Bible with believers, there is a sense in which fear is paralyzing and captivating to them. 
So not only are we going to have this beast who is going to reflect for us the, the, the fear that is often caused as political powers and government turn and really don't make life easy for a believer before Christ returns, but we're going to see a second beast, and this second beast here that we'll look at next week is going to be a beast who does a lot of miracles and signs and wonders. And the, and the tool that is used there is deception. Deception. If, 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 if Satan, through his assistance, cannot get you with fear, then what he will do is aim to get you through deceptions and lies. So in between the first and second coming, both fear and deception are real tools, real methods that we need to be wise about. And we need to understand how he wants to use both government and religious things to really bring about that kind of destruction, if at all possible. Now, I do want to remind you, because you may never come back after today, if you're visiting Uh, This section that we are studying, chapters 12, 13, and 14, 12 shows the dragon, 13 brings the beast, but guess who comes in chapter 14? That's right, Jesus. (laughs) So we do win. So in case you don't come back, just don't think that this is going to be all bad because it is really, really good. And in fact, in all the sections up to Revelation 11, every time it presents a section, whether it's about the church and how the church is on the earth, or it's about seals or trumpets of judgment and all that, in all those sections, every time we are never left thinking, "Uh uh-oh, what are we going to do? Every section always presents Christ with incredible victory and triumph, and it brings shout and joy to the people of God no matter what we go through, no matter what we endure. And so that's what's going to happen as we look at this section 12, 13, and 14, the fourth section on the persecution of God's people. We're going to see in the end, we win. We win. All right. Here's how I want you to think about this now that I've kind of set up that chapter for you. Because walking through the verses is not going to be hard. It's not going to be difficult. If you kind of already are seeing that this is a passage that really is going to present some challenges to people. Here's how I'd like you to think about this chapter and maybe some questions that uh, just as you sit there will make you think about really where your commitment and your allegiance lies and where my commitment and my allegiance lies. Here's what I'd like to ask you. What would it take to draw you away from trusting God? What would it take? What lies might you be susceptible to that could convince you to stop following Jesus? What ideas, values, or goals could be more influential in your thinking than God's kingdom? If someone wanted to turn you away from being a Christ-following Christian to just being a, quote, in name only Christian, what would be the best way to accomplish that goal? How would they do that? Would the threat of physical death turn you away from following Jesus? In other words, would you be a Christian if it were illegal? Would you? Would you still stand? Would you be willing to die rather than renounce your faith in Jesus? Would fear of poverty or financial insecurity lead you away from trusting and following God? In other words, would you be willing to give up your job, your income, if that's what it cost you to follow God? Would fear of being alone lead you to sacrifice your principles and date and marry someone who doesn't even love Jesus? Here's the point. What fears or lies would Satan pull out for you that would keep you from wholeheartedly, unashamedly following Christ? Listen, if you're not thinking like that, you're missing something of great importance because he is after you. He is after every one of the children of God. And he will use fear, he will use lies, and he will use deception. And if you're not thinking that he might pull some of those on you, then he's already got some deception going on in your own life. And so John wants us to see this beast. He wants us to grasp what this beast is all about and how he works so that when it comes down to it, and should it come down to it in our life, that increased suffering or persecution comes, we'll be, be ready and know how the fear and the lies of deception are at work. 
So what we're going to do, we're going to work through the verses, and we're going to help you think through what they mean, and then what I'm going to do is give you some application here in the end. So let's go to our Bible, and let's first of all look at what I'm going to call the concept of this text here. How should we think of verses 1 through 8? That's, this is where we get the picture and the idea of this persecution and suffering that is going on. And what I want to do is, if you want to follow, I'm going to do it rather quickly. If you want to follow through, I'm going to give you pretty much a real simple outline. They're all going to start with the letter D, okay, because that's just the way my mind works uh, in this passage. And it kind of is going to help you get a concept of who this dragon is, or this beast is, rather, and what he is up to. The first D you might want to write down is verses 1 through 2, and it's the word, the description. Let's see the description of what this beast looks like. It says in verse 1, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. I'll stop right there for just a moment. When it says the dragon, we already know that's the imagery of the devil from Revelation 12. And it says he stood, and in other words, he took a position. And he stood on the sand of the seashore. Now, this could mean this war with the saints is on earth. Okay, it could mean that. As, as opposed to the war in heaven that we saw in chapter 12 behind the scenes of what we cannot see in the spiritual realm and all that. It could mean that here he's talking about this war that is a visible, real war that we see and we experience versus a spiritual war that is going on behind the scenes that we can't see. Or this phrase could refer to a great number who side with Satan in the war. Could mean that. Just remember in the Old Testament when God promised to Abraham how vast his nation would be, his people would be, what did he use to tell him how great it would be? Like your, na- your people will be like the sand on the seashore if you can number them. One of the imageries he used to talk about the greatness Now, you might want to jot down in Revelation 20, verse 8, the only other place that this phrase is used in in reference to Satan and this war is in Revelation 20, verse 8. And it talks about Gog and Magog, and we'll get to that, as Will has probably already told you, in another year or so. (laughs) But when you get there, it uses that same phrase, speaking about their numbers and their power. Add to that if you want to, I think, that this beast coming up out of the sea in verse 1 could imply that this war is chaotic and it's filled with turmoil and it reflects kind of the hostility that's about to arise on the people of God. You notice it goes on and says he has ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems or crowns and all these blasphemous names around those crowns. Now you just need to know this without a lot of detail going into it. That imagery is very similar to chapter 12, verse 3, when you see that same imagery with the dragon. You say, well, why would the dragon have this imagery of these heads and these crowns and and this blasphemous stuff and all that, and the beast have the same thing? Well, very simple, because this beast represents and assists the purpose of the dragon. So verse 1, we begin to get a description of who he is or what it is that uh, John saw coming up out of the sea. Verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like a, now notice the animals here, a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, a lion. Now, in order for us to figure out why these animals are used as part of the imagery, we need to turn somewhere in our Bible. And if you have to go to the front of your Bible and look at the table of contents, that'll be okay. But take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And I want you to notice this prophecy, this this vision that Daniel was given by the Lord. And as we read it, I want you to notice that it contains the same animals as in Revelation chapter 13. I'll give you a moment just to get there. I want to read with you and have you just to follow along as we look at the first eight verses just in reading. He says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and vision in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and he related uh, the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the, here it is, great sea, same as Revelation 13, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. That's very important. These are different animals and distinct and not joined together. 
unlike what you'll see in Revelation 13 in a moment. The first was like a lion. There's an animal just like we saw in Revelation 13 and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until, I, until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. Verse 5, and behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. That's also in Revelation 13. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this, I, I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard. There's that beast again, that animal like we saw in Revelation 13 which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, I want you to notice something. There's no animal used to describe this one, right? No animal. You've got a lion, you have a bear, and you have a leopard, but no animal that describes this one. Notice verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little horn, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boast. Now, you know, Pastor Kevin would like to part there <laughs> for a while. But let me just tell you something. I'm going to just tell you how I think and what's going on here. These creatures that Daniel sees are representative of rising empires and nations prior to the coming of Christ. It's not hard to figure out. We can look back in history and figure out that this fits these nations so very, very well. The lion obviously is reflected in the rise of Babylon. It was like a, it had a ravenous appetite. And then when we see the bear overtaking the lion, because that's what it says it does in the text there, we see the Medo-Persian. It has these crushing claws, as it were. The Medes, more predominantly the Persians, ruling in that dual empire of theirs. And from a lion to a bear, another comes, a leopard, and most theologians would believe that that represents the rise of Greece. And that's kind of historically what's happening here. You have Babylon, a major world power that arises. You read about it in the Old Testament. The Medes and the Persians come, and then Greece comes. And you remember Alexander the Great? You studied all about him in school for sure, and you know about his conquest. Uh, and, and like a leopard, his conquest was said to be so fast that he conquered the then known world of his day. And I was reading just this week that when he, he had reached what he thought was all he could conquer in the world, he literally fell down and wept because there was no other place in the world he could own and conquer. That was his rapid at his young age succession of ruling and taking over the world. But then there's another animal or another uh, kingdom that is talked about in Daniel 7. And I believe it's used to describe the Roman Empire. I think that as you look at it, uh, that it's described as dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong, iron teeth. It's, it devours, people tremble, it crushes down. I think that it's not hard to see because that is the next world power that comes into existence. And I asked Will to send me this picture because in our men's Bible study just recently, we were, were looking at this topic of the rule of Rome and what had happened there. And if you look in the red around that Middle Eastern part of the world there, you know, you see Judah over there where Israel, that little slice. Everything in red is how much Rome took over in that day. Incredible. This is the powers in Daniel 7 that rise and fall. One greater than them comes and conquers them. But I don't want you to be stuck right there. Look at your Daniel 7 one more time. And look what he says in verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames and its wheels were a burning fire. This is not a, a spaceship or anything like that. This is a, an imagery of God's glory. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. But I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. 
I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extinction of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I love verse 13. I kept looking. (laughs) In the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's why I'm telling you, we win in the end, right? That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom that lasts forever. That's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ. So all these worldly powers rise. One greater than them destroys them. And we end up with this Roman Empire at the coming of Christ. And God is telling his people through Daniel, oh no. That's not the final kingdom. That's not the one that is ultimately going to rule and reign. Just keep looking, keep watching. That kingdom is coming. Now, I would bet you, as I told you when we started reading the book of Revelation, if you were a first century Christian and you picked up what John just wrote in the book of Revelation, that's kind of how you'd be thinking right then. Wow. This is a cruel empire around us. It has turned against us. It has tortured us. It has taken us and it has taken believers and put them in pitch and lit them on fire in the garden of Nero so that they could actually be just like a candle to light up the garden. Cruel, fierce powers of Rome. And so back in Revelation 13, if you want to go back there, let me just show you something that is so unique about this beast that just came up out of the sea. The dragon standing on the sand of the, of the seashore. This turmoil is coming. These powers of darkness are gathering to work. And he sees this beast come up out of the sea with horns and seven heads and crowns on the head speaking of political power and authority. And the beast which I saw was, now listen to this. He didn't say I saw and they were distinct. He's saying that this beast that comes out is the culmination and the combining of the worst of the worst of the worst. The idea here is not that he just saw one empire come and another empire. This is one that he saw and this one beast was like a leopard in his feet like that of a bear in his mouth, like that of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Now here's what I want to say to you. In John's vision, it's not four separate creatures or four separate things that he sees, but one combined in all of this to say that the persecution would include, no doubt, what was going on in those empires that rose. But watch this it will far outlive those empires as well. In other words, it's not just limited to Rome and Nero and and some power that they were under and, and suffering through in the days of the early first century church. But I think we can actually see from this that that extends and continues right on, obviously at various levels and degrees, but it doesn't just end because Rome was conquered. doesn't mean that at all, or was destroyed, I should say. And so the dragon, it says, gives him power. He presents and reflects the dragon's Satan and operates under his power. That's the description of who we're we're looking at, this, this representative, this one who comes to rule and to wage this war. So let's go down to verse 3. Here's the second D you'll want to write down. It's the word death. So if we have the description in verses 1 and 2, we have something of a death that takes place in verse 3. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. Um, This is where it gets sticky, okay? (laughs) This is where the challenge comes in, so let me just kind of plow through this with you for just a moment. It definitely refers to, since this is all the work of Satan, a deception, whatever it is. 
Okay? It's deceiving, it is a deception, and it comes from the deceiver. And I think it's safe to say by verse 3 that you could write that this death is a counterfeit resurrection. A counterfeit resurrection. Jesus did die, and he was raised again. Here we have this power, this work that is set on destroying, and this one who's representing Satan, uh, this beast. And here it says that his that one of his heads had been slain and his fatal wound was healed. Now that's where we have to kind of guess and maybe do our best conclusions on what that's about and what that represents. I, I do like what one, one person said. He says, quote, Christ was killed and raised and the world said it was a lie. The beast is said to be slain and raised to life and the world worshipped him. Quite a contrast. So who is this? Well, one group of scholars says that this verse refers to the death of Nero and the myth of his resurrection. If you know anything about what happened with Nero in A.D. 68, uh, he fled and he went and he committed suicide. Well, the rumor started going around that Nero was going to rise again and come back and take over. So some scholars say, well, that's exactly who that is. That's what it's referring to here in this chapter. Other scholars say that this verse refers to the Roman Empire uh, in which Caligula, Caligula uh, had got a, some kind of dangerous illness, not sure what it was, but it, he, was, he was infected with that disease and later recovered and they saw it as he rose back to power again. A final group would say that this beast is descriptive, uh, descriptive of the theological counterpart of all that Christ is and represents And it cannot be, though, contained to just one historical person or groups of people. In other words, it is picturesque of not just what Nero or other Roman empires might have done, but it actually does refer to just this antichrist, this this setting against everything that Christ is and what he desires. I I would feel safe to say it is an antichrist uh, in character, and nature, but not necessarily referring to just one person, not in this text right here. Maybe somewhere else we might say that, but it doesn't seem to fit in the text there. And we could unpack for a long time today why that is or is not. Um, Even some said, I was reading even early this morning, one commentator said that this is nothing more than an imagery of the fulfillment of Genesis 3 whenever... um, uh, God promised to the woman that the head of the serpent would be crushed and he would crush him. Not so sure that fits, but that's what some think as well. We could spend a great deal of time thinking about this and speculating on whether this is referring to the political power of Nero all the way to Obama. We could do that if we wanted to. But in the end, hear what I want you to hear. We would all just be pooling our ignorance. Throw it in if you want, but you really don't know. You can't say. You really cannot say. One pastor wrote, we do, not have, we do not have to have much of an imagination to understand why the church in the 1930s and 40s concluded that Adolf Hitler was the perfect candidate as the Antichrist. He grew up in Europe and was for years an insignificant leader of sorts. However, he grew in power and influence until Germany lay at his feet. He claimed to be the champion of a new superior race. It was not long before he was gobbling up European nations in a quest for world uh, domination. And to this fact, add to this fact that he hated the Jews as well as Jesus Christ and saw himself as the world's Messiah. Hitler even boasted that just as Jesus Christ's birth had changed the calendar, so his victories would be the beginning of a new age. He actually said, and I quote, What Christ began, I will complete. At one of the Nuremberg rallies, a giant photograph of Hitler, and I wish I'd have thrown it up on the screen for you, was displayed, and it carried the caption, quote, In the beginning was the word. So I'm not telling you there's not people who rise in political power to claim that they're going to overthrow Christ and be the one whom the world should follow and worship. I'm just saying you're guessing when you try to figure out who that is. History tells us the church was wrong in 1930s and 40s, right? They were wrong. And should the church exist for another 1,000 years and other powerful figures arise or 2,000 or 10,000? Or who knows how long the church will remain on the earth? They might be guessing just as well as you and I. 
And who they think in their generation really represents an antichrist would literally not be one we would ever think of. Or they may never look back and think that. Or they could look at us and say, look how wrong they were in thinking that they knew who this person was. Here's what I'd be safe to say. You want to hear this? This is my safe assumption of the passage here and what to look at at this verse. John was likely depicting the complete counterpart of Christ through all the ages, but was tying that description to a historical figure named Nero that the people could relate to and understand. But the beast is not limited to referring only to Nero and the Roman Empire, for it is descriptive of all evil nations and people who will oppose Christ and God's work. This is how the nations are seen when you study the word Antichrist, which is used in other places, when the nations rise up to do the bidding of those who are against Christ. And it may be led by a figure. We just don't know who that would be. And I'm not going to guess with you who it could be. You say, you're real helpful, Pastor Kevin. (laughs) I just appreciate that so much. Well, let me give you a a, a few thoughts here. Uh, uh, Let me see if I can get to where that is. I might have gone too far. Well, I didn't go too far. I just didn't put it in there. Let me do this for you. Here's a couple of thoughts I would leave you with to go home and think about when you think about the term Antichrist, okay? The word, number one, Antichrist, is never used in Revelation 13, right? I mean, read the whole chapter. You won't find that word. It's not there. Now, I'm not telling you that Antichrist against Christ, actions and attitudes are not revealed in this chapter, but I'm just telling you this, that word is not used there. And what makes it even more interesting to me is that John the one whom God inspired to write the book of Revelation, wrote the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in 1st John and 2nd John, he uses the term Antichrist five times. So it's not like John doesn't know that term. Okay? But it's not used in this imagery. He doesn't define and describe who this is in this passage here as an individual. When you look at John's usage of that, and this is the second point I would give you. First of all, the word is not used, Antichrist is not used in Revelation 13. Um, Secondly, you could apply this passage to an individual Antichrist as long as you use it in the way that John uses it in his epistles. And here's how John uses it in his epistle. I'll just let you note this. They're in 1 John 2.18, 1 John 4, 1-3, and 2 John 7. Again, 1 John 2.18, 1 John 4, 1 to 3, and 2 John 7. If you go read those passages, what you'll discover is he talks about that the spirit of Antichrist has already come. He says we are in the last hour. And he doesn't mean like, you know, it's just like any moment Jesus is coming. The last hour refers to that time in history between the first and the second coming of Christ. In that period, which has gone on for 2,000 years, we have been in the last hour. Would you say we could be in the latter part of the last hour? Very possible. But the reality is the last hour is not just, you know, a week or two or three and a half years before Christ returns. It refers to this period in between the first and second coming of Christ. And he says, we know we're in the last hour. And he says, and the spirit of Antichrist has already come. It is coming, he says. And yet... At the same time, he talks and describes one who will come and who is yet to come, as if there is something more. Now, keep in mind, in Scripture, we always think in terms of this is what is now, but there's yet something more to come. Just like we read in the end time passages about there's wars and rumors of wars and natural disasters and so forth, there's always been those. But they will increase and they will grow greater and greater in degree, in intensity before the return of Christ. So here's the way my mind likes to work around this Antichrist thing. There's always been, since Christ has returned to heaven and while we're waiting to come back, there's always been this little a Antichrist, right? This whole spirit, this whole outlook, this whole approach to things that are opposed to and against what Christ wants and what he's revealed in the word to us. There is that little a. And I'll leave room in the thing that as time increases and as we approach the return of Christ, we might see the big A come, a bigger A. One more dominant, one more predominant, one more obvious. 
you know, who that might be, again, we just cannot even begin to, to go there. I think you could, those of you who really want to study this out a little more, you could sometimes go to 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 8, and there it talks about a man of lawlessness. And in that passage, it is describing that lawlessness is now, but there is a man of lawlessness coming. And so we can think in terms of, we do see this now, but there seems to be yet a future aspect of more of that to come. And when this happens, the spirit of Antichrist will take all of the previous aggressions. If that big A comes and, and that, that dominant person arises, will take all of the previous aggressions and persecutions of the lion, the bear, and the leopard to the depths that no one has ever seen before. That's the idea, I think, here. So let's quickly move on in the end. The description is in verses 1 and 2. This supposed death, maybe it is a deception to make people think that uh, something miraculous has happened. Maybe it will really happen uh, to an individual, but for sure it is a deceptive thing that takes place because look at verse 4, which leads to the third D, and that is the word devotion. They worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? To the entire Antichrist political government movement, all of that that is against Christ and what his eternal purposes are, can ultimately bring about, lead, led possibly by one individual or not, it ultimately leads to the worship and the surrender and the allegiance to that system rather than Christ. That's what he's saying in verse 4. And what will drive the beast, this Antichrist, this spirit of, of Antichrist is fear. It is fear. Because you'll see that now as the text begins to unflow. Suffering and persecution and loss of property possibly will be weapons and tools in the hands of that political power. Look at verse 5 and 6, which leads us to this defiance, how he turns in defiance on those who do not follow him. There was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Meaning his time is limited. There is not a forever amount of this. Verse 6, and he opened his mouth. Notice in verses 5 and 6, he uses his mouth. He says things to intimidate and to bring fear. Blaspheme is against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. And so his words of defiance are directed towards God and they are directed towards his people. And it may include even his, the angelic host that he just despises and speaks so disparagingly against. He blasphemes, you might say, the very character of God and the children of God in those verses. Here's the next D, verses 7 through 8. This is the destruction that he brings. Not only does he have this defiance towards God's character and the people of God, his children, but verse 7 and 8 talk about this war, this destruction that he brings. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Now listen, don't let that trouble you. When you read that, it says he was able to make war with the saints. He's turning on them, and he overcame them. Listen, you might want to write this down to the note of your Bible there. This is only a physical overcoming. This is only a physical overcoming. This is not spiritually overcoming. This is not them losing their salvation. In fact, so that we know that he's not talking about anything other than the physical torment, the harassing, persecuting, and possibly executing that has gone on and could go on in the life of the believer, so that you know that that's all that he's talking about. And for some of you, that's just terrifying. What's more terrifying to me is to think I would forever possibly fall away and be separated from the Savior. And yet he wants you to know that can never happen. He does not have that authority and that power. Look at verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Now this is where you get to shout again this morning, okay? (laughs) Because listen, if you live for just personal comfort and psychological contentment, you're in trouble as a Christian. But if you go, you know what? If that happens to me, that's okay. They cannot touch my soul. 
then you're going to be okay. You know? Let me just say this to you, because some of you are sitting there going, I thought we were leaving. I thought we were raptured out of this. (laughs) You're breaking my heart, Pastor. Listen, let me just tell you this. If we go out before any of that kind of severe torment comes from an individual like this or political powers like this, I am going to high-five you on the way out. And I'm going to let you look at me and say, I told you. And I'm going to be okay with that. But just in case, (laughs) just in case, uh, you might want to consider what he's saying here. And what he's telling us here is that your security in Christ, because of where your name is, is that nobody's ever going to separate you from God. Now listen very carefully. There's two books in the Bible that are mentioned. These are important for you to know and just jot them down. There is a book called the Book of Life or the Book of the Living in the Old Testament. It's found in Exodus 32, verse 33, and Psalm 69, verse 28. And in those verses, when you read that, don't confuse it with this book that we're talking about called the Lamb's Book of Life because in that book, I like to refer to it as the Book of the Living because when someone died, their name was removed out of that book in that day. Here's how it worked. If you lived in a town or a city or a village, what happened is everybody's name was recorded by the clerk in the book. That was called the Book of the Living. If you were alive, your name was there. You were registered. Not much different than today, right? (laughs) But here's the difference. When someone died in that day, they went and they erased their name. They blotted out their name. Because why? They weren't alive anymore. It was the book of those who are alive. And so the book of the living is not about a spiritual issue. It's about just who's living and who's dead. And so in Exodus 32, 33, and Psalm 69, verse 28, when it talks about names being erased or blotted out, it's talking about just being alive or dead. But the Lamb's Book of Life, this is the book of life pertaining to, listen to this, or belonging to the Lamb. This is his book. This is not the book on earth, the book of the living or dead. This is the Lamb's Book of Life. This book belongs to him. It pertains to him. And this verse is not saying or threatening us that a believer uh, might have his name erased or blotted out of that. If you read again in Revelation 21, 27, it talks about the Lamb's Book of Life again there. This is not a book saying or threatening us that your name might be taken away. In fact, I think John is saying it this way. Hey, if they kill you and then go to the town clerk and say, we can erase his name from this book, they'll never be able to take the name away from the book that will last forever. Your name will never be taken from the book. It was written, listen to this, before you ever committed the first sin, right? Because it's before the foundation of the world. Don't you love that? (laughs) Before you ever committed the first sin, put your name in the book. And listen to this. Before, and when you commit the last sin of your life, it'll still be there. It's never going away. That's the promise. Now that's why I love the doctrine of election. Because the doctrine of election if you study it in the Bible, is always couched in the context of suffering and sorrow and loss in this world. And it will be an undergirding of your faith and a confidence and a strength to you that no matter what they take from me here, they cannot take my soul. I don't need to fear that because nobody's going to take that. That's why, isn't it why Romans 8, don't you love death? What will separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, persecution, death? Oh, no. He's already thought through this. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's, that's, that's the concept here. That's, that's what you're supposed to get out of verses 1 to 8. Okay? <laughs> now, I'm going to wrap it up here. Here's two things I want you to think about, because this is what I'm really concerned about. I'm not concerned about trying to figure out who is, quote, the big A here. <laughs> And uh, who might rise to this position as Nero did at one point and then others have come in their place as Hitler's or whatever, uh, Stalin or whatever you want to pick in the history past or future. What I'm more concerned here is a couple of things that I don't want you to be deceived by. One is I think the passage should help us to think back about those opening questions that I gave to you. What does it take to turn you away from Christ? What would it take to cause you to stop being a wholehearted, full-fledged, publicly declared follower of Christ if persecution came? 
That, I want to take you back to that and just think for just a moment here. And I want you to learn something. I want you to learn that, that we're not looking for the big A here, so to speak. We've got to watch out for the little A, the spirit of what is called the spirit of Antichrist. That which is against Christ, this is the challenge that is before us. Notice back in verses 5 and 6, he talks about a mouth. He speaks things, he says things, and these are things that really are against Christ. Now, I wish he gave us a list, but the list he could have given in that day would not have been appropriate for the things that go on in our day and that are spoken. So let me give you some that I hear when I'm listening and watching and hearing things that are just sold to us through our television and marketing, and just through conversations that people tend to have in our culture. Here are some of those lies. These are some of those antichrist deceptive statements that you want to watch out for. They go like this. What you do in private is nobody else's business. Divorce doesn't really hurt children. It prepares them to face life on their own. Marriage is the union of two loving partners regardless of sexual orientation. Now, some, I got to let me pause on that one. Somebody said to me one time, well, pastor, what are we going to do as a church if the government says we have to marry and, and, and we have to participate in same-sex marriages? What are we going to do as Grace Bible Church? What, what if they tell us they're going to take away our 501c3? I go, they can take it. They can take it. Why? Because we are not living under the government. We are living under God. And we are not living for what might make life peaceful and easy for us here, but for what is to come and that kingdom that no one can snatch us away from. So that lie is out there, and that deception is being politically politicized and and sold into our culture again and again and again. Here's another one. I, I put about 20 of them on here. I've heard them. You've heard them. Belief in moral absolutes is proud and unfair. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's okay if you think that way and you feel that way, but don't you dare think anybody else should think that way. Here's another one. If it's legal, it's acceptable. <laughs> that's, what <I> wanted, <laughs> that's what I want to tell the pot smokers in Colorado when I go to this conference out there. Because <laughs> I'm going to do a conference in Colorado. And that's the way to, okay, it's legal, so therefore it is okay. Telling someone they are sinners in need of forgiveness is really hate speech. That's been said. Sexual relations before marriage proves you love them. Truth is a relative term. It's up to you to save planet Earth from destruction. Pride is one's own self and one's own accomplishments are part of a healthy self-image. You're part of the universe, a piece of the divine. I'll just give you a few more and I'll stop. Bisexual experimentation is part of discovering the real you. All the wisdom you need is already within you. Abortion is the removal of fetal tissue. What you do in Vegas will not follow you home. At 21, it's legally and socially acceptable to get drunk as long as someone else drives you home. Listen, I want you to be aware of when you go into this world as a believer... There is an anti-Christ attitude. (laughs) And you need to to live with that challenge in your life that that is something that we don't need to buy into. It is part of his deception and his work. And to really stand against that is to, in many, many cases, experience a lot of fear. A fear of what they will think of us. A fear of what they will do to us. A fear of what that can cost me. That's part of his tool and his weapon. Now, finally, and we'll stop at this. I want you to also think about this. You need to probably make up your mind to live with the decision that suffering is a potential for you as a Christian. That's what I just want to caution you with. You know, we don't think like that in this American culture. But if you go to China, you go to Iraq, you're going to discover real quickly they've made that decision in their life a long time ago. Following Christ can literally cost you your life. We live so comfortably in American culture here that really when we think of persecution, we think of it because, and I'm not telling you it's not some form of that. I don't want to belittle that. But we think of it in terms of somebody just saying something to hurt our feelings. Or we didn't get a certain tax break. Come on. (laughs) So, 
it is important for us to live with the decision that suffering is a potential for you as a Christian. Did you notice back in verse 8, this, note this as we close. It says that it was given to him to make war. You say, given? You mean God lets him have that uh, privilege, that, that, that permission, that delegated ability? That's what the text says. He allows and he often will use as part of that process even Satan himself. Remember when Job experienced that? Satan was allowed to control the winds of nature to create a tornado that collapsed the home where Job's children were were feasting. He was allowed to influence the mind of warriors who came and killed Job's servants. He was allowed further permission from God. Satan was able to exercise his power by sending disease to Job's body, covering him with the bulls and sores. Notice all of that physical suffering. But he couldn't touch his heart, couldn't touch his soul, couldn't touch him as the man. Satan's fear tactic will work as long as you're trying to avoid any troubles in your life or you're really afraid of standing for what you know is true and right as God has revealed it. So, as we close, look at what it says in verse 9 and 10. This is kind of like the conclusion. This is the commentary at the end of these verses. And this is the application, isn't it? He says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. That is, in other words, just listen up, pay attention. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If that's, if that's what happens, then that's what happens. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword, he must be killed. In other words, if that's what happens, that is what happens. Now, I want you to notice something. I love this. He said, here he is. In other words, this is the conclusion. Here's how you should be thinking if that happens to you. If you ever find yourself in that kind of position, here is what you should be thinking. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. <laughs> they just don't quit. They just don't give up. They just don't. They keep on pressing on because, again, they have heard that Daniel 7 has another king that is coming, another kingdom that's coming, another one who will reign. And did you notice as we read that text earlier this morning, and of that kingdom, there is no end. No end. So as we work through the first piece here, we see that there is a potential for great fear from political power and from governmental control and things that may be totally against Christ. Where will we do? What will we do? What do we do in those times? No matter what the heat of that comes, what will we do? We must persevere. We must keep on. We must keep on. Let's pray. 